we move now to our second panel, which focuses on uh, business excellence lessons from the medium-sized companies or the middle stand. Now, most of you know that some of the most competitive companies in Europe are medium-sized companies, particularly popular in, in Germany, Austria, and, uh, and parts of Central Europe, Northern Italy. Uh, but these companies are actually spread around, the, around Europe, so we have examples from other parts of, of Europe today. Now, these companies face today important opportunities uh, in terms of growth, but also challenges based on competition, financial conditions, etc. Um, so to discuss um, how these companies can leverage these opportunities and can they, can they continue thriving in, in Europe, um, I would like to invite to the, to the podium my colleague, uh, Steve Chick. Uh, Steve is a professor on the Technology and Operations Management Department at INSEAD. He is a member of the uh, uh, European Competitiveness Initiative. He does research on this topic. He is ho the holder of the Novartis Chair on Healthcare Management, and he's been running for many years the Industrial Excellence Award. Steve, the floor is yours. Looks like my partners in crime are on their way up uh, as well. Great. Uh, thank you very much for, for this invitation um, to, to be able to speak to you about an area that I'm very passionate about, and that is uh, business excellence. Could we get the slide up, please? Um, today we'll be uh, having an opportunity to, to look a little bit at uh, what is competitiveness and what does that mean in, in France and Germany, especially where we've done quite a bit of, of research on, on outstanding performing firms. Uh, this is a, a study that I'll, I'll describe in a little bit more detail, but we've also had an opportunity recently to look at some Eastern European uh, companies. We've expanded into Spain, Benelux, and we're looking to expand into England with this uh, multinational study of what it means to be competitive. Now, if we look at uh, different sectors, um, we know that you know, automotive, semiconductor might be more advanced in some other sectors in terms of deploying uh, operational excellence uh, techniques. Um, even if we pick a given sector and we look at different firms within that sector, we often see very different performance when comparing one firm to the next. And even if we look in one firm, which has many, may have many plants in the case of a multinational, uh, we see heterogeneity in performance uh, from one firm to the next. So what we've done is we've tried to pick a study to try to tease out what is it that makes an extremely competitive firm. What does it take to be world class, in, in especially in the industrial sector? So that's what we'll be focusing on here. And a part of that will be looking especially at what can the Mittelstand teach us in terms of competitiveness. We've seen some phenomenal organizations in that space. What is the Mittelstand? Well, there doesn't seem to be a consistent definition of that. Uh, some folks will define that in terms of revenues, say between 100 million and, and 5 billion per year. Uh, others will define that in terms of number of employees. There may be other uh, metrics uh, to go with that. Um, some recent statistics uh, that I've, I've picked up were that for the country of France, about 20%, 28% of employment, uh, employment would be in that space, whereas 38% of French exports are coming from these middle-sized firm. So this represents a very significant part of the economy. Perhaps that's why uh, Javier was giving us these statistics a little bit earlier, that says this is potentially a place for incredible innovation. So that's what I'd like to, to take a peek at uh, here today. Um, just in terms of, of framing the issue, I'd just like to make a couple of words. Uh, the study that we've been doing for a number of years, uh, Industrial Excellence Award .ed .eu, if you want to take a peek at that, uh, you can see all sorts of wonderful stories about high-performing firms. What is this that we're doing? Well, it's a research study that's been ongoing in France uh, since the mid-90s. Uh, it's also an awards program to celebrate excellence. And we do this both to learn what is it that makes plant management uh, plant managers tick, management teams and plants, as well as VPs of business units. Uh, so we're looking at this level of analysis. Um, our partner in France has been Usine Nouvelle for, for, since the very beginning. Um, winning plants, of course, get articles written about them in Usine Nouvelle, 
And we bring uh, lots of great research into the classroom at INSEAD based on this study. Uh, our partners in Germany uh, at WHU in Koblenz uh, with Professor Arndt Huxemeyer has been really leading the charge uh, there. In Germany, uh, the study is called Die Beste Fabrik, and uh, our media partner Wirtschaftsvolke has been uh, publishing that. So if you're familiar with Die Beste Fabrik or Trophée des Usines in France, that's us. Uh, we have uh, recently started expanding with our partners at IESA in, in Spain to look at operational excellence in Spain. We've heard a little bit about that uh, over the last, uh, last hour. Uh, we've also expanded into Benelux in the United Kingdom. What is it that's special about our benchmark? We're looking at all different sectors, all different sizes of firms. We're looking at productivity. We're looking at quality management. Uh, we're looking at strategic positioning. I think what makes ours, uh, our analysis unique uh, when we go out to uh, when we get uh, questionnaires, we go out and visit these top performing plants to do uh, a site visit for all the finalists. What is it that we're looking for? Two things stand out as being unique about this particular study. One is the integration of different key processes. Some studies look only at manufacturing productivity, lean total quality management. We're looking at new product introduction, new product development, new process improvement, and supply chain collaboration and coordination. So that would be one feature. We're looking at the integrated package on delivery of the, of the strategy. How do you operationalize that? The second key differentiator would be in the area of strategy deployment. So in that particular space, we're looking at how is the strategy understood at each level of the organization, whether it's the VP level, plant manager level, first year manager, supervisor, or even frontline employee. How is that integrated? Does everybody pull in the same direction? What are firms that may have won this over the last decade? Well, a number of the firms uh, and plants, I should say, it's not a firm level, it's a plant level, uh, you're probably familiar with. Any of these logos seem familiar? Uh, I think uh, most of those logos people feel uh, pretty comfortable with, and you're probably not surprised to see BMW and Siemens and Continental and ABB and Procter and Gamble uh, listed up here. These are different plants within those big multinationals. These multinationals are really leveraging uh, the back office systems, the sophisticated management systems, systems around productivity, the Toyota production system, for example, being brought into Continental as the Continental business system to try to apply lean management principles to all business processes. So that's probably not a surprise. But we do see a number of firms that are in that Mittelstand space. Actually, Forisia is a plant that was one of the early winners uh, about 10 years ago of our award. They were a Mittelstand back then. Today, they've grown into a very large uh, player in the automotive supply uh, sector. Rational. Anybody here know of Rational? OK, a couple of people. I see a couple of timid hands there. Rational is known to every chef in the world. They are the number one producer of kitchen and catering uh, cook equipment. So stoves, they innovate, they, rent, they innovate every three, four, or five years, completely new product lines. They have 54% of the global market. They produce 100 million plus meals per day. Uh, Image, another uh, big player, or, or I should say small player that is, is, is quite strong. Image is producing uh, thermal uh, uh, printers, industrial printers for uh, labeling. Uh, they have shifted from a pure technology provider of this printing equipment to put labels on water bottles, yogurt bottles, pharmaceuticals. They have turned themselves into a service system supplier doing barcoding, uh, doing um, uh, brand protection in terms of trying to prevent counterfeiting of pharmaceuticals, trying to do things uh, around uh, data traceability of products through the supply chain. So radically uh, reinventing themselves through time. But what we've seen in terms of key success factors here, we often think of operations management as saying, you know, got to go lean. Well, lean is not enough, folks. You have to have, have, to have uh, new product ideas coming through the pipeline. These are, there are small firms out there that are reinventing themselves every few years. 
They apply these principles to the new product introduction processes and their innovation processes. They understand at each level within the organization what are the goals of, of, the, of the organization. For Rational, that is people need to eat away from home. Everybody in the organization knows that. And then it's disciplined execution on each of those four key processes that, uh, that we just outlined. The manufacturing, supply chain, new product innovation, new process improvement, and finally, the strategy deployment would be the fifth uh, uh, process that, that needs to be mastered. How do you get everybody pulling the same direction? With those, this notion of focus, disciplined execution, having ambitions to go global, that's a recipe for success that we've seen in some of these peak performing plants. With that, we've done some statistical analysis that shows that you can improve on production, job creation, even in France and Germany, and do so with less capital employed. Uh, with those opening remarks, I would like to uh, perhaps turn this over to uh, David Jolly, who is uh, with the International Herald Tribune, and who will be facilitating a discussion to pursue some of these concepts. Why is it that the small companies can compete, and why do we see so many firms in, in Germany, for example, as compared to some other countries around the world? And we have, he'll be introducing our experts for the panel. Thank you, David. Great. Hello. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to what I think actually is going to be a very good panel here. I, in fact, I volunteered for this uh, when I heard about it because it sounded like such an interesting idea. Um, I've been covering global finance and business for more than two decades. And in, the, in your uh, brochures, it re refers to me as an editor. Actually, other journalists would rec recognize me as a general business correspondent. I think that um, the question of uh, comp competitiveness um, is often reduced to simply a question of unit labor costs, and I, I know that's wrong. Um, something is happening in Europe, we all know, that is keeping Europe from fulfilling its full economic potential. Um, I'm not an expert, and I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I can tell you that um, these smaller companies, which are often family-run, they're the pillars of many economies in Europe and, and these uh, countries' reputations for quality. Obviously, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, of course, but also France and Italy. These companies are doing something right, and I'm hoping that from this panel we'll learn something about that at a time of economic stagnation, high unemployment, and political discontent, frankly, in much of Europe. Uh, let's move on to our panelists now. We'll start with uh, Rudolf Knunz. Uh, we, we're lucky to have two Austrians on our panel today, and Mr. Knunz is the first. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the real Austrian. Cornelius is working in Austria, German mind. <laughs> okay. Um, in the last 25 years, I've built up a cross-industries group together with my partner, Stefan Pira. We have uh, two mid-sized or middle stance companies in our group. One of them you might know, maybe we have some of our customers here, is the KTM motorbike. The uh, second one is less known, is the company Bankel. Uh, there we do high-tech uh, parts for the automotive industry. Basically, 30% as a, as a KTM is in the range of 700 million euros and Bankel is in the range of 140 million euros. 30% of the sales for Bankel goes in, in parts for the Formula One cars. So in every Formula One cars, you have uh, components in, in the engine, in the drivetrain, and in the chassis from, from the company Bankel. I'm also sitting on the board of a Mittelstand company in Austria in, in the paper industry. Uh, they have two main products uh, where they are among the market leaders worldwide. One is in paper for religious books. So the, the Bible and the Quran are probably printed on the same paper. Um, the second one is sophisticated uh, cigarette paper. So if some of you are still smoking a Marlboro, it might well be that uh, you're smoking one of our, uh, is, 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 is our paper on the cigarette. So these companies all share a common business model or strategy. We focus on very specialized market niches in big markets, uh, in 
term uh, by KTM, we, we, we are specialized in off-road bikes and ready-to-race bikes. We have big competitors in the market, our dear four Japanese friends, uh, Honda, Yamaha, Kawasaki, and Suzuki, and to a certain degree BMW. Um, <coughs> we go for high-value products, high-tech. For those, we also charge a, a premium price, obviously. We are strong in branding. We try to control worldwide the distribution network, really to have the hands on and not to be dependent on any importers. Uh, and we have uh, manufacturing and R&D centrally located in Austria in the headquarter. And now f slowly we are moving with some manufacturing to emerging markets. And one common thing from all those companies to uh, produce a good healthy profit. Thank you. And our, our next speaker is Hubert de Boiredon, who is CEO of, uh, Armor. of Armor yeah. in Nantes, France. Yeah. Good afternoon, and thank you to, um, to INSEAD for inviting me today. So first of all, I will also say that uh, Armor is not perfect, but it's true that it can, be some, can bring some hope that, uh, to others that it's still possible to produce in France being a leader worldwide and being competitive. Um, we are really a middle stand company or ETI, ETI, ETI in France because we have um, 1,900 employees. We are making a turnover of around 220 million euro. Now, what is Armor? Armor is a leader worldwide for making printing consumables for uh, printing uh, barcode labels. So actually one of our customers is, uh, is image that uh, Stephen just mentioned. Um, we have not been always a leader. We were number three in 2004. And through different actions, maybe we can detail later, we became number one. Um, what's interesting also is that we are the only producer in Euro terms. All our competitors are producing in dollar zone which has not been so help helpful since 2004, I would say. Um, but this did not, did not uh, prevent us to, uh, to get a, a leadership position. Um, we have other businesses. We are also printing remanufactured cartridges for laser and inkjet. Uh, in, you know, laser uh, cartridges for companies like yours or inkjet cartridges for uh, for individuals, but with one specificity that uh, we uh, they are all remanufactured or recycled, and so we we invested a lot on sustainable development in our policy, and recently we launched a program based on our industrial know-how to uh, prepare the third generation of uh, thin film photovolta photovoltaic organic film uh, for the new solar energy uh, industry that is coming coming through. Thank you very much, Hubert. Uh, next, we have Cornelius Alexander Krupp, who is chairman and CEO of CAG Holdings in Markdal, Austria. Yeah. First of all, I have two uh, nationalities, by the way. I mean, you should know. Huh? So, um, <coughs> now, I'm in the sixth generation entrepreneur. Um, we have uh, today something like 6,000 people. Uh, we are very centralized with the, uh, what, re what regards the ownership. Um, <coughs> so uh, it's about 50 times bigger. I have to be a little proud. Um, the, bu the business is today 50 times bigger than it was when I took over. And we are ba mainly in three areas. The one is um, aluminum processing. Um, the second is uh, glass factories and companies. The third is fiber companies. We are um, convinced that we need to be as Mittelstand, the classical Mittelstand, we have to have small units. So if a company grows too big, more than 300 people or so, then we split it. So we really have small companies all the way through. We have more than 30, 35 locations in the world. We have um, developed, of course, globally, which is sometimes a pain in the neck because um, you are urged and asked by the customer, and you're pushed into this. You don't want to do it. You are in China, then they say, look, 
also in the north of China. So uh, this is difficult. And also, of course, we have to follow because not only because the customers need it, but because to economies of scale, etc., we do that. So uh, we are in also in small niches. We are a world uh, leader in certain areas, very small areas, like shoots for roofs where the roof runs on. I mean, nobody would know, but there we are world market leader and uh, in several areas. But also very local brands, like in Austria. Uh, we have a roofing system, which I think is the best in wherever. And um, um, he was in the roofing, by the way, also. But he left. So anyway, this is, uh, this is what we do. And um, I hope there will be many generations to come. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I'd like to start um, by asking a few questions and, uh, to our panelists and then ask the audience uh, for their questions. Um, how can, first of all, how can Mittelstandes compete against the BMWs and the Siemens and the giant uh, multinational companies without the same degree of uh, things like uh, management, sophisticated management systems and all those advantages that the multinationals, the really big companies, enjoy. You want to answer that? Yeah. Um, I had the chance to go to INSEAD in 77, and we had a series of case studies how the Japanese motorbikers destroyed the American, European motorbike industries. I think everyone, with the exception of BMW, was bankrupt sooner or later. Uh, so KTM in 91, and, and so it was a special pleasure for me to... to get engaged in KTM and, 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 and start to fight against the Japanese. Um, the, if you look on up to 2007, the world was clear. Yeah? Uh, we have seen our market in North America and in Europe. That's a, a market size of about 1.5 1 billion units. If you look on the Indian market, this Indian market alone is 12 million units. So you know, it's a small part of the whole motorbike market. So the Chan Japanese manufacturer, they make the money in Asia. They are not making the money in North America and in Europe. So they were not focused so much with the, uh, with the top management attention on the markets where we were in. And if KTM has a market share in the off market of about 20% or 25% worldwide, the Japanese, the big Japanese are also small players in in those markets, and uh, they don't have that cost advantage as they would have in the real mass production markets. So in fact, we choose, we have two brands in KTM. Uh, one is KTM. We choose to fight with KTM against the weaker Japanese. That was Suzuki and, and, and Kawasaki. There's no way to fight against Honda. Uh, you know, the, the, the big champions, a great company. Better to leave them untouched. And then we have a second brand, that's Husseberg. In Mesutoburg, we were fighting against the remaining smaller European brands. And finally, you know, we knew we have to be, if, if, if one, we have to be the survivor against the Japanese. And now all the others have more or less left the market. And we are the only, in our niche, the only known Japanese option for the customer to buy. I think that's very important to have. If you're in the niche, you have to be the, the market leader in there and, 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 and that real niche player option for, for, the, for the customer. Maybe uh, another thing uh, compared to BMW, which is also our dear, dear competitor in Bavaria. Um, no, I'm now 20 years with KTM. In BMW, I have shaken hands with six CEOs were responsible for the for the motorbike unit. So for BMW, the motorbike unit is more or less a training field for future <coughs> managers in the car industry. All, all they want to do is to, uh, to be three, four years in the, in the motorbike part and then to move up to the car industry. So BMW was changing its strategy every three years. And that was really helpful for us. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, maybe I can ask an answer, uh, sorry, ask a question of uh, Cornelius. Um, why do you think it is that Germany has is the home of these, of typically the home of the great Mittelstand companies? Why is it that Germany seems to have nurtured these companies? Is there 
some logic to that? Uh, I mean, to be a guest, uh, a guest in fr here in France, uh, it's very difficult to all the time represent Germany uh, because this is overdone anyway these days. I mean, but it's uh, a fact, right? I mean, okay. we're not talking the, about. Uh, um, we, I think, uh, Germany is much more decentralized, first of all, than France, uh, and for that reason, there are many separate regions, areas which are important and where you have a direct access to all stakeholders necessary. So in other words, in Stuttgart or in Hamburg or wherever, they are always, you're close to the decision-making politicians or whoever you need. This is very, in France, I think it's not like this. So not exactly like this. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, the other side, I think um, over the years, uh, one has to say uh, that uh, I have to mention the unions, I'm sorry to say, uh, because I tried uh, three times to establish uh, companies in France. Uh, one, I didn't, at the very end, not, uh, uh, didn't do it, because the unions didn't uh, accept, and the unions didn't sign, and they were really, in the end, a real fundamental enemy, and I have to say that. And, uh, and two of the companies had to give up, had to close down. I mean, uh, this was the fact. And uh, the unions in Germany are part of the game. They are sitting in the boat, not you up there and us down there. So this is a fundamental difference uh, in Germany in, in, uh, uh, fundamentally. And also, I would say the labor law, uh, I agree with you, one shouldn't always mention labor, but um, <coughs> labor law in Germany is very flexible in comparison to other areas in the world. And also, if uh, in France, let's say, one in the end uh, will have a law where a profitable company is forbidden to close down a factory, uh, it's not very attractive. Uh, I mean, for the Mittelstand especially. Because you want to be in the Mittelstand, to, if you want to be successful, the main and very important factor is, I think, to be as independent, as open, and not restricted as possible. And uh, I think that is in Germany uh, very well done these days. The hard system, et cetera, et cetera. Many other things are these days very pro-entrepreneurial spirit. Thank you. And Hubert, as uh, our lone French representative from the uh, Entreprise de Taille Intermédiaire, um, what advice will you give to uh, Mittelstand or would want to be Mittelstand uh, type companies? Well, f first of all, when I look at the, the experience of Pharma, we are competing against very big groups like uh, ITW, Dynepen, and this didn't prevent us to be leader worldwide. So why? I think first because we, we focus very much on a niche. Uh, we are less dispersed than many big groups, and we decide with a very strong determination to be leader in this niche. So this means that we we bring all our cash flow and our ability to invest is directed into one direction. So maybe this is the first advice, to be clear on what strategy you want to reach. Um, second, um, how could we be competitive in a high cost uh, wage uh, or salary uh, country? Uh, through We could do it through investment and innovation. Um, if we compare Armour now be, uh, uh, with two, uh, the situation is two, in 2004, um, we did not fire anybody. We maintained the same number of people. For instance, in our main plant in Nantes, we are uh, 500 persons. So we are still 500 persons, but our production has increased by three times with this exactly the same number of people. How did we do it? Did we do it? We invested in productivity machines, in robotization, at the same time, we train the people to grow their skills, to become pilots of machines instead of being maneuvers. And this changed also the relationship with trade unions. Um, in 2004, the situation was very conflictual. Now, I would say we built a very positive and constructive uh, social dialogue with the trade unions who, who support our strategy. So I think also another advice is uh, um, to invest in innovation and productivity. This is very important. The third um, 
the, the third thing that can be helpful is all this is possible if you you want to gain growth, if you want to target growth, if you grow. And how can we can we grow being in France? Actually, we created a model of what, what we call co-industrialization. This means our big plant is in France where we do the semi-finished products and we we do this, the finished product on order to deliver all our customers worldwide with a maximum delay of three to five days by putting finished uh, product, small industrial units all over the world. So this is how we invested in uh, Cincinnati in the US, in Manaus in Brazil, in Singapore, in, uh, in Guangzhou, in China, in Japan, and now we have a project in, uh, close to Bangalore in India. And this is totally different from de delocalization because actually when we gain market in Brazil or in India or in China, our production in France is growing. And with this sp positive spiral of investment for productivity, this means that the plant, the turnover of the plant and the volumes is growing with maintaining fixed costs at the same level. And this enables us actually to be more competitive than Chinese plants. Uh, we, 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 we invested in a small Chinese plant for, for, for the, for the semi-finished product, more to show to customers that we're also able to have Chinese product if they want. But actually, this plant is not more competitive as the one in France. This is very interesting to compare. So it's still, my message is that uh, by, by this model, it's possible to be um, competitive with a middle stand company. Now, one, one key issue is the reactivity, flexibility, agility of a middle stand company. You know, we've been able to make decisions for 50 million euros uh, in one afternoon. Because, you know, uh, we meet with a shareholder, I present the, the, fi the reason, the file, and we don't have to go through 10 committees and strategic committees and marketing committee and, and you know, and validation all over. I was before in a big multinational group and I can see totally the difference, you know. To be able to be quick, to decide, we, we, we decided to invest in India in one committee, and that's all, and everybody is in line, and we can be very reactive. This is a big asset for the, I think, the middle Sun company. Excellent. Um, and uh, Rudolf, you had earlier made kind of the same point about the finding, finding the niche, the niche that the Japanese companies weren't properly exploiting. Would you well, would you agree with Uber? Do you have any other ideas? Any other recommendations for Mittel Stone type companies? I mean, um, in our case, we had to uh, to face uh, tough challenges. Um, starting in 2007 with Lehman Brothers, all you know, the, the, the uh, our market almost disappeared. So the motorbike market in northern North America and Europe went down by 70%, can you imagine? Uh, even if you're a leader in there, you know, and if you gain market share three times, you, you, you lose quantities. So we adjusted our strategy. We uh, partnered or we got a minority shareholder from India, the Bajaj Group. They make 4.5 million motorbikes, which is, you know, but compared to Honda, they're still a niche player, so it fits together. And now we're working together, we, you know, we had to learn to work together with a much much bigger company, but we have technology, we have brands that gave us uh, good uh, power structure in, in, in our deal. So now we are we designing, we are, we are developing, we are marketing uh, the, the, the products in Austria, manufacturing them in India, and bring them now to, to Europe uh, as a high value or premium entry type bikes, which you know are still possible to sell now in Spain. Not everyone can afford a car anymore. And we sell the same bikes uh, in, in the merchant markets as a premium bike. So we shifted the, uh, the strategy and, and I would say in two, three years, half of our bikes will be manufactured in India. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, constant work to, to, to be up to date. Uh, on the same level of power with, with, with our partner in India. And I think as a middle stance company, you always have to look with, with who are your stakeholders, with whom you work together. Normally, we uh, try to work together with, with companies of the same size, where we are important customers. With a low company, or if I place a bond of 30, 90 million euros, I'm not going to the 
to the big investment banks because there I will not get, uh, I'm not an important customer and I will not get a good service. I go to a small boutique which takes me seriously and I think that's important as a as a middle chance gesellschaft to, 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 uh, to choose the right stakeholders and it's getting more difficult with, with the supply chain because they're more moving to bigger companies. So. Great, thank you very much. So if I can summarize a little bit of our discussion here, um, Uber thought uh, that we should companies should target a niche, invest in productivity, target growth. You were largely in agreement with that, I think, and you also mentioned trying to find partners of the same scale who took you seriously. And uh, Cornelius uh, gave the advice of don't invest in France. I think that was his. <laughs> no, no. Can the, did you want to, Did you want to add anything to that, Cornelius? Uh, or shall I? Or do you want to add anything to that? Do you have any particular advice? Or? Yes, we'd like to add. It's not true. Okay. <laughs> okay. And with that, why don't we open up the uh, floor for questions? Um, do we have a mic? Some other mic? Do we have any questions? Ah, go ahead. I'll, I'll take a couple of questions uh, and maybe ri actually write them down so that we can uh, each of our guests can have a choice in what they want to. Uh, Timon uh, Balaskakis, uh, former Canadian ambassador to the OECD. Uh, I think a very important question is who competes against whom? If you compete within the same uh, monetary zone, it's quite different from competing across monetary zones. One of the things we learned in Canada is a very important aspect of our competitiveness is our, uh, our exchange rate with the US at 62 cents to the dollar, which used to be the case uh, way back. We were much more competitive than at, at, at one to one. Now, Europe at one point was 90 cents and now it's 132. Uh, does that, isn't that a very important issue that has to be taken into account if you consider competitiveness? Can I? Let us take, let us take one more question so that you guys can all have a, have a chance. Oh, there's a, sorry, I can't see. Oh, right, right next to you. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, I'm um, Yong Lee from uh, KAIST. Uh, this may be out of context, but then, uh, Middle East, uh, you don't you have any ambition to be one of the conglomerates? Uh, <laughs> I mean, so uh, how do you uh, keep that vision or as a dream uh, in your uh, management uh, routines? And uh, in doing so, uh, you may go against uh, the big companies, and uh, in that situation or uh, you know just uh, out of nowhere uh, I'm asking you uh, is there some uh, the government does does government have some role in playing nurturing your ambition uh, I would like to leave that uh, at the question <laughs> okay. who, who would like to take that uh, one of those questions I'll leave you with that. Well, so, so for, for the first one uh, it's clear that uh, for instance, Armor being the only producer in Eurozone, without making any effort, all our competitors were gaining 35 to 40 percent um, competitiveness. So actually, maybe this has been a chance for us because we set up as a standard that we had to compensate that by productivity. And actually, if the, if the Euro is going uh, uh, lower, it might be an asset now, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, and uh, the second, yes, of course, we want to grow now. Okay, we need to remain humble and uh, being a big conglomerate maybe is not the next step, but the following one. Um, um, but I think having a vision of growth is important. It's important also to motivate the teams. And this is why now, based on our industrial know-how, our know-how, for instance, for us is a, a know-how of coating thin films. And we find out that we can use that in uh, the sustainable energies for instance, organic photovoltaic thin films, and also for storage batteries. So we have ambition to develop new fields based on our industrial know-how, and to to uh, to new, to uh, to develop the growth. And of course, the government have a, have, a, have an impact. And I think, in f well, if I can say in France, uh, uh, some problem is that there are there are some limits, you know, between companies. Uh, if you reach 250 million euro, you are penalized between 248. Compared to 228, you begin to have more taxes to pay in cash, uh, and so on and so on. So, so um, I really think that the, the government should withdraw all this, 
all, all these uh, limits which are not m motivating for growth. Okay, uh, Cornelius, would you like to have a, have a shot at that? Uh, we have a company in Montreal, so I know what you're talking about. Um, we have, of course, dealt with this over the years. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are happy that uh, Canada is so successful, uh, also with the currency. But anyway, the second question, I mean, it's an obvious question which we have to deal with every day all over the world. I mean, excuse me, Ambassador, but this is something which I think is, uh, is normal operational activity. But the other question, do, do you not want to be a big conglomerate? I think we are a conglomerate. You probably are not a conglomerate. But uh, before we get too big, and before we have to deal with this, where you were mentioning these sophisticated systems, when we go to a meeting, then we are alone and have seven people across the table, and they ask us for all sorts of uh, systems, and I'm very careful not to overdo it because you know this is more internal, and we are very much outside-oriented. And this is a pain in the neck these uh, sort of the development into big systematic approach. This is not our attitude at all. And if we are getting too big, we are splitting it up. That's what we do. Not to be too big in those various sectors. Rudolf, do you want to have, have a shot at this one? Uh, to the first question, we have to look where we're coming from. You know, when before the, before the euro, if I look in our company, KTM, you know, motorbikes, that's in Southern Europe. I had 89% of my sales in the Peseta, Scudo, Lira, Drachme. You know, uh, that was really, that gave a lot of instability to the company. Now we have uh, more than 50% of sales in the Euro. And Slovakia joining the Euro, Slovenia joining the Euro, so it's getting bigger. Um, concerning the US dollar, Five years ago, we had the same profit in Europe and in States with the exchange rate of 107, and now we moved that up to 130. So we become better, we raised prices, more pro and, and did some other measures. And now we are manufacturing or, the, or buying some products in India, and that helps us to balance our dollar exposure. Our main question is what happens to the yen? Is our dear Japanese friends uh, are manufacturing in the yen? And, and that exchange rate, we have to watch carefully what possibilities that give for them in competitive pricing and um, things like that. Can we get uh, another question? Right over here, please. Yeah, hello, I'm uh, Mark, Mark Doswell. Uh, I live in a uh, neighboring country to Austria called Switzerland, where we have a lot of um, innovation and entrepreneurship and think those things. And it's a great pleasure, I have to say, to, to live with all those crazy entrepreneurs. Um, I have a question for the panel. I'd like to give each one of you a magic wand. And you can wave it. And the politicians throughout Europe will then change their behavior. And I'm looking at a mental model here. I have a feeling that to go to converging on competitiveness, there are old models of thinking, there are old ways of thinking which block us. We want to go somewhere new. And to do that, you have to throw away the old. It gets too big, you chop it in half. I take Cornelius's point. So my question to the three panelists here is, if you'd wave a wand, and the European politicians would en bloc change, you, you see the point here, and do something different, throw away something, what is it that they, you would like to see them throw away so we can move forward? That's one. Can we get, can we get another question, please? Over here. Hi, my name is Raya. I'm from Malaysia. I'd like to know, I've heard that basically you saying that politicians, you can't wait for the politicians to change things and the businesses have to move forward. However, in working around the world, what have been policies which actually stimulate the growth of the small and medium-sized companies. What do you see are most um, are the key drivers? And if you could have policies, what kind of policies would you want? I, know, I think beyond Germany and France, probably. <laughs> Thank you. Those, those two questions go together quite well. Um, 
Cornelius, you want to start that one off? I'm sure you have an opinion on this. Uh, I mean, it was uh, from our Swiss friend. It's a very theoretical question because the politicians um, really want to stick to it. They really want to be reelected. So they do everything what is not really wished for. So, um, but in theory, I would say they should, first of all, the, the periods where they are elected for should be longer. So that there is not so early the urge to give away, to motivate uh, the people to reelect them. So that will be very important first. And secondly, they should leave us alone. This is uh, because they don't create any job. They don't never create a job, never anyway not sustainably a job. They only sort of try to do that before the elections a little bit, you know, to spend money, waste money very often. But I have a very positive attitude towards the politicians, in general. So, thank you. And and uh, and as to the second question, the, any policies for stimulating uh, SM, our, our Malaysian uh, member of the audience had asked about actually st helping. The SMEs actually helping small the Mittel Stan companies. Is there some policy that they, they should follow that they're not following, or is that is the answer leave us alone? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. As the question is coming from Malaysia, I would we'll go back in our history. The most important thing in which really drove our growth that was when '96 when when Austria joined the European Union. Uh, to have one one big market, you can imagine in, in, in KTM we have to homologate our bikes. We had to homologate the bikes in, now in twen twenty seven European states, and if you have ten models, twenty seven difficult homologations, we have ready to race bikes. You know, it's not it's they're at the limit of 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 of, of noise and, and 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 all that stuff. Um, it costs a lot of money, costs a lot of efforts, and you have 20, 270 models suddenly. And if you have demand in France and you have man planned it, manufactured for the, for the German edition, you cannot sell it in France. Since the European Union, we have one model European wide that gave us such gross potential. We had no, and then we have one central stock, not any more stocks in each country. We had to go from general importers to sales subsidiary that really jumped our sales and jumped our profits. And, and, and I would hope that, you know, that some other markets would follow where we have that free market to, to, to work with. Hubert? Well, for me, I think uh, there are three, three main points. The first one is a behavior thing, is to really promote and rehabilitate the entrepreneurship attitude and the entrepreneurship. Uh, mainly in France, we need that now. Uh, you know, there's been a perception that entrepreneurship is bad and the bad guy that we, we will money against the society and so on. We need to change that totally and give the, give the will to, to the young uh, students and so on to be entrepreneurs. You know, I'm, I'm surprised to see that my sons, uh, they, they think of going uh, outside because they think they have no, no future as entrepreneur in France. So this is really a pity. So we need to change that. Um, second, they might be simple things uh, linked with taxes. Know, if we want to 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 create more dynamic on investment, well, is it possible to change the accounting rules, for instance, to be able to able to depreciate quicker the investment and so on? So this is this doesn't cost anything to just boost investments. You know, something that can be done. Um, third thing, I'm not for reestablishing import duty rates and so on. I think this is not not the the, the good way, but. They, they, they need to be a kind of, of, um, of statement that everybody needs to have the same rules. We need, when we need to, to invest so much money on security, sustainable development, uh, and so on, and we, we have competition from companies wherever they come from uh, who don't apply the same rules and can be much more competitive, not on difference on wages, but just on different, on, for instance, respect on patents or sustainable development. This is really penali penalizing us. So I think there should be a, an international rule that the buyers should be made responsible on the respect of some uh, ethic laws, you know, ethic, ethic uh, concepts, to respect patents, for instance. They cannot buy a product that doesn't respect patents. If the retail, the, the, the retail companies would do that, we would regain market share against 
I say, unlegitimate competition. But it's not the case today. Any, any other questions? I, yeah. Can I follow up? Oh, on sure, that? please. Um, you know, I wish we had a magic wand. It would be great. And I, I, we've been working on an alliance with Hogwarts lately, but I don't think that's <laughs> quite finalized yet. And, I, you know, our, our panelists here have already spoken about what might be interesting to change in terms of policy. One observation I would make is that uh, policies differ from one country to the next. And you, you move from one country to the next, and there are strong players and weak players. And I think there is a big role for management to play in differentiating the stronger players and the weak players. Just like there are different cultural traits uh, when you cross the boundary from one country to the next, there are aggregate differences. But there are huge differences amongst individuals from those countries. Same thing in firms. So I think uh, you know, focusing on improving dialogue uh, within plants, you know, we talked about unions a little bit earlier. Uh, the dialogue between management and, and unions, you saw some major wonderful changes in Germany you know, eight, ten years ago with the globalization movement. In France, we're seeing that now, too. It didn't happen as, as soon. As we're seeing more and more of that over the last couple of years. But we're seeing this type of change. And I think beyond policy changes, just local management behavior can change as well and can have a huge impact. So just an alternative to changing the policy. Uh, another question? You had raised your hand earlier. Yes, please. Hi there. My name is Michael. Uh, a couple of, of thoughts um, or something we haven't talked about yet. One is, uh, I guess, culture and, uh, and ethics, and the second is capital structure. I wanted to get your thoughts on this. I noticed uh, working in Germany that a lot of the German Mittelstand leaders know their customers very well. They know their suppliers very well. They and their families are known in the community very well. And to what extent you know, that might be part of the Mittelstand story. And the second is capital structure. A lot of these companies tend to uh, invest out of current operations. Uh, they will uh, not borrow first and invest and hope that it works, but rather uh, wait until they have the money, borrow long term, uh, again from local banks who are known in their communities and so on. And whether or not an explanation for the Mittelstand story is that community embedded long term capital works better than anonymous short term capital. Is that a fair or an accurate, or is that in my mouth? We can know. address that. Is, another question? Is there another one? Oh, yes, please. Sorry. I see you back there. Right here, please. It's coming. Yes, uh, I would like to, to ask a question uh, to the panel. Uh, following on the comment of uh, Rudolf, which was saying that the uh, opening of the market and the fact that you didn't uh, need to homologate your products had made you uh, great, uh, uh, great uh, benefit. Uh, so we've seen that uh, European Union has opened the, you know, the free market in, in all of Europe, and we have had also the Eurozone. Do you see that the next step for the uh, Mittelstand uh, in, in homogenizing uh, the fiscal policies, for instance, and, and also in promoting uh, uh, diploma and in promoting also the move of people around Europe, is that going to also bring a lot of benefit to the to the middle stand? Thank you. I think there's a question in the very back over there. Can we add that one? Thank you. Uh, my name is Christelle Musset. I'm working for uh, a European chemicals agency, so policy makers, European uh, institution. And I was wondering, because you are always uh, discussing about uh, um, competition, uh, working in niche products, competing uh, against large uh, companies, uh, let's say worldwide, and what we are doing in Europe with the, I'm, I'm working with this famous uh, uh, legislation which has been very controversial, which is called REACH. It's about uh, chemicals products. And do you consider that, that my, my re answer, when it's, since it's very controversial and everybody is saying that it's cost a fortune to the companies and especially the SMEs, um, my answer to them is always to see uh, the benefit of having policy and uh, the benefit of having uh, green chemistry, sustainable development. Do you see a model for you 
to compete also on these aspects. Because basically, it seems to me that now uh, Asia or uh, other countries are ready, for the consumer in these countries are ready also to take into consideration where the bioproduct, the fact that uh, it has been taken care of for the, the human health and the environment. And uh, what are your reflections on that? How can you put that in your competitive model, uh, the fact that there is ethics, uh, green sustainability? Thanks very much. Thank you. Who would like to take on the, uh, the culture and ethics? Uh, would you like to do that with your side? Last one. Uh, you may do that one if you like. Yeah. <coughs> Maybe I'll start with the first one on the, on the Deutsche Mittelstand, no? about financing. I think that that's the story up to 07. Now it's becoming very difficult for, for the Mittelstand to get financing from the banks. The Deutsche Bank has disappeared as a as a lender for for corporates, you know, they are now in dreams of investment bank and returns of whatever. No, um, I think that that that's that's a challenge for the future to get to get the financing from the banks because for the capital markets, the, the companies are mostly too small. So that I see as a main challenge coming up in in, in, in financing for the for the middle stand. The second part of that question: what, Is there a, an advantage in the sort of family? Community relations, the culture and ethics of the of the Bittelstand companies. Yeah, um, I think some people feel uh, feel safer and and, and and like to work for the conglomerate, and other people are brought up in a culture where they where they feel better in, in the local community and are integrated there. And I think um, and that's a chance for the Mittelstand. No? Cornelius, did you have a, a thought? I, I think this is, this is something very important. I believe um, if you are a middle stand, standler, so to say, I think you have real fundamental responsibility for the region where you are. Um, and I think this makes also, gives, enriches the whole organization very much and gives a lot of value for, a value for the whole community and for the stakeholders. I think the regional responsibility uh, is something often underestimated, but it's most important because you have to stick to the com community. You, are, you have to be taken liable for what you're doing. Ethically, you are responsible and you feel it. So uh, the responsibility for the region, and not only just on an ethical basis, but on a daily, daily real reality basis, I think that is very important. Thank you. And Uber, can I get you to address the last question? We're going to have to wrap up here in just a second, but um, the question that was, was raised about, uh, as a chemical company, maybe this is a, a place where you could step in on the question of yeah. Well, uh, I consider that the, the REACH program is, is, uh, is positive because um, it forces our suppliers, wherever they come from, to reach the same standards as the constraints we have. And you know, this is, this is very important. And all is linked with uh, respect of environment, of uh, respect of people, and uh, respect. And uh, I, I really think this is the right direction. You know, w once again, I'm not for uh, reestablishing duty, import duty rate, and uh, protectionism, and so on. But uh, enabling the world to progress by taking more care of the environment, on the people, and uh, and on the on the labor law, and so on, is very important. You know. And when I see that some, some uh, w we can be forced to close some plants in Europe, not because we are not competitive on wages, but just because <coughs> our competitors don't respect the same rules as, as we do, uh, this needs to change. So, so I, think, uh, I think the European Union has some responsibility in that. And for the second one, for regarding taxes, uh, and the fiscal laws in France, at least, we, we we feel we are many to feel that we are penalized by the fiscal system uh, regarding transmissions of companies, and certainly this is influencing the middle stand. You know, if if we, if there are not some ways to facilitate the transmission all over generations, uh, you cannot create middle stand companies, uh, and certainly this is a strength of Germany that they've been able to. You know, most middle stand are at the third or fourth generation of entrepreneurs, uh, which is quite important. Thank you. Uh, this makes a great point of departure for Stephen to uh, wrap it up for us. And maybe you can address the, the question that was left unanswered, which is what are the next steps for the middle stand? 
do I get get, get to solve the whole world problem? Yeah, yeah. All right, I, uh, I really appreciate the questions and, and the responses and the expertise uh, that, that's sitting here in the room and uh, the whole room. Um, very interesting. What I'm hearing is is that um, you know the size is is important. That uh, this middle size does have a special feature. This this notion of of working together, of of unity, of of easier communication, and engaging an entire organization to pull in one focus direction or a couple of very well-defined focus directions. That seems to be a theme that's emerging here. I think another theme that seems to be emerging is really pushing towards globalization, embracing that, and not being afraid of that, uh, going at it as, as, a, as a place where there's opportunities. Working in Brazil creates jobs in France. Uh, the same can be said uh, for the other European countries. So I think that's a, that's a wonderful uh, dimension to be, to be running in as well. And that means being open to, to, to new ideas. That's innovation and being agile and being able to respond quickly. And I heard that as a, as a theme several times as well, of being able to come together in a small group, quickly make decisions, uh, not to, to be extremely volatile, but to be dedicated to an area, a theme, and, and to be agile in, in reacting to the outside world and pursuing that. So, so I think that's a, that's a wonderful uh, set of concepts we can take away from this. Um, I have one more uh, slide I'd like to, to just put up uh, for you here, and that is, um, you know, each year we do this industrial excellence study. Uh, this fall in September, we'll be having a conference uh, to celebrate this year's winners in France and Germany, and the, the, the winners from Spain have not yet been named. Uh, but uh, this is going to be a wonderful opportunity to pursue this industrial excellence model. Actually, in 2010, Armor was one of the winners in France uh, of this competition, and, and so it's really nice to learn what's been going on in Armor uh, for the last three years. But if you want to see a, a plant tour of a high-tech facility, BMW Leipzig, if you want to learn about some great things that ITRON is doing with smart uh, data analytics and, and controlling water, if you want to see two firms from the Mittelstand, Deckel Maho, uh, a world leader in machine tools, Rode and Schwartz, a world leader in telecommunications towers development, and some of the really neat things that they are doing in terms of growth and, and some of the themes that we've been talking about here with the Mittelstand, uh, and how Rode and Schwartz and Deckel Maho from the Mittelstand are competing against these giants. Or you might want to see um, steep plastics, which I'm, I'd be surprised if anybody here has heard of. Very small company um, near Grenoble who's doing some wonderful things in, in medical device manufacturing, especially in the area of plastics. So if you want to see some operational excellence, the size doesn't matter. It's some really great uh, management tools. And, and thank you for sharing your wonderfully great insights on management in the Mittelstand.